So yesterday we started our pros and cons list of the 2023 season for the Tigers. Yesterday we talked about the cons, what went wrong for the team. Today we're going to talk about the pros, what went right for the Tigers in 2023. All today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Friday, October 6th, 2023. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. Also, just because the Tigers don't play anymore doesn't mean you shouldn't still check out the SiriusXM app. Uh, still some great baseball that you can listen to on the Sirius XM app. So uh, yesterday we started doing our pros and cons list. And yesterday was obviously the cons day. We talked about what went wrong for the Tigers. They still are a, are a sub 500 baseball team, right? They still lost more games than they won throughout the course of the year. Uh, still plenty to improve on. But I said it at the end of yesterday's show. And even given, you know, the 24 hour like grace period here to think about it, I, I still stand by that what I said at the end, which was, I don't think any single thing, not one thing we talked about on yesterday's show of like things that went wrong for the Tigers are unfixable or catastrophic toward the future. I don't think any of those are like, oh my goodness, this is such a big failure. This is such a big deal that it's going to hold the team back. It's going to prevent them from being successful and it's unfixable. I don't think a single thing on that list fell into that category, which is A, encouraging, but also B, when we transition into today and we talk about what went right for the team this year, uh, A, I feel like what went right is is probably a uh, – I don't know if it, like if it's just that black and white of like right and wrong. Maybe the better way I should have phrased this from the beginning was like surpassing and failing to meet expectations – Maybe that's the, the better way to phrase this because it's hard for me to say like, oh, way more went right than went wrong this year. When again, like they were still a, a sub 500 baseball team at the major league level, but organizationally a lot went right and a lot surpassed expectations. And I think that it kind of injected a lot of encouragement and optimism about the future of the franchise. So uh, I, I think that today's list is a just more fun because at least for me i guess man i <laughs> if you go on the internet maybe not to all people but uh to me like talking about the, the the things that are going right is a lot more fun than talking about the things that maybe aren't but uh, i i think that again like none of the bad things are are hindering the future and when you look at several of the good things we're going to talk about today they are like long-term implements right like they're they're things that are, are going well and they're long-term pieces. So I think that that's good. I think that that's good. Uh, I'm going to start with just overall the, if we're to break the team down into offense, defense, starting pitching, relief pitching, okay, on a very broad scale at the major league level. The bullpen was slightly below average uh if you look at just because it's one number not saying that it's a perfect number but just because it is one number and it's easy to kind of uh, understand the the value behind just one single number uh reliever war the tigers finished 20th in baseball in reliever war so like not terrible not one of the you know bottom eight or nine teams in the league but uh, not in the top half of the league either. Either uh, I think we had some really good relievers and some guys that when they went out there, you knew it was probably not going to be too pretty. Um, so that was a little bit of a step back, I guess I'd say, from last year. But all in all, I, I think people are optimistic about what this bullpen can be. You have people like Fiedo. Uh, you, honestly, you have several multi-inning relievers like that. You obviously find Holton, who we'll talk about in a second, Jason Foley, who we'll talk about later. Um, I, I, I think... Next year, this bullpen could take a huge step forward. I think it's kind of primed for that if you add to it this winter. If you just sit on your hands and go, oh, we'll figure it out again, you're going to be around 20th again. Um, starting pitching war. 
The Tigers were 12th in baseball. If you, this is all Fangraphs war, and that's kind of subjective, but I think Fangraphs war is just better than baseball reference war pretty most of the time. There's some specific positions I don't. Regardless, not important. Um, but they're, they're 12th in starting pitching war as a team. Almost a top 10 rotation in terms of war in baseball. And this is a rotation that had a lot of injuries, had a lot of rookies throw innings, uh, ended on a very high note, had one of the lowest starting rotation ERAs in baseball in the final month of the season. Uh, A a lot of legitimate ground and and steps forward were made in the starting pitching staff. Now, the offensive side of the ball, defense, they were pretty middle of the road. They started off really well and then kind of fell back down to earth just because they don't have much talent on the defensive side of the ball. Um, But I think that that's something that clearly Scott Harris wants to address. Every time he's asked about why Malloy and Keith aren't in the majors, he points to defense and base running and stuff like that. So um, I'm not worried about this team like being horrible defensively long term. It seems like a high priority for Scott Harris, which I can appreciate. The offense is really the big one because uh, by the end of the year, they were a bottom five offense in pretty much every category. They were a bottom three offense in a lot of categories. And... Uh, but if you if you break it down into smaller segments, you kind of get a little more optimistic about it. So, um, like in the first half of the year, I mean, my goodness, for you know the first like two and a half or three months of the season, uh, they were legitimately like fighting every game to with like Cleveland for worst offense in the entire sport. They were comfortably thirtieth for the first like six weeks of the season, then slowly started to crawl out of it. Um, but if you look at the end of June, uh, if you if you look, well, I guess I should say early July to the end of the season, they're closer to like the 20th range. And then if you do just August and September, they're almost right in the middle at like 15 or 16th ranked offense in terms of just like runs scored and, and war produced and whatnot. So uh, th- there is a little bit of like, hey, in the second half, it was a lot better than the first half. They just dug themselves into such a hole in the first half. Um, that uh, they weren't able to get much higher by the end of the season. But uh, there, I think there is some optimism in terms of like this offense next year, if the team makes some moves this winter, sh- has pretty much zero excuse and should not be a bottom three, bottom five offense in the sport. I think that that's why they were able to keep their head above water and go over 500 in that time span as well. Okay, makes sense? Man. I don't know why my nose just randomly gets so itchy on air. It hasn't happened in a while. If you're a longtime listener, you you remember back like last winter. I feel like last offseason it used to happen all the time. Maybe it's just an offseason thing. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, some of the individual players and kind of concepts. You know, we've gone through the just like broader, you know, offense pitching and kind of where the team stood this year. Um, let's talk about some of the individuals, okay? And we will do that right after I stop itching my nose, goodness gracious, and after I tell y'all about our friends over at Sleeper. The MLB playoffs are right around the corner, which means that the clock is ticking on your chance to 100 times your cash. Well, the clock is still ticking, but the playoffs are here. Uh, But you can 100 times your cash on Daily Fantasy Baseball. Baseball has never been more exciting than it is now. Uh, We have Acuna. We have the Braves. Oh, my goodness. Is it Red October? Is it? Do you believe in Red October? Because the Phillies look like the most fun team in baseball, et cetera, et cetera. You can go to any of the stars on these teams and pick more or less on stats like home runs, hits, strikeouts, and more for up to 100 times your payout on Sleeper. Get your picks right, and you could win big. Okay, it's absolutely awesome. Use promo code locked on as well, and you get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked On Tigers. I appreciate you all for tuning in, making us your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We'll be back on Monday. Well, I don't know what we're going to talk about on Monday. We don't have a weekend. This is the first weekend without baseball, without Tigers baseball in a very, very long time. So I don't know what we're going to talk about. I have a couple of like evergreen stuff like these that I still want to get to uh, in the next like couple of weeks before we really shift into like offseason stuff. We got to do player reviews as well. That'll be a big chunk 
of the next several weeks. So maybe we kind of start dabbling our toes into that. But I also want to do like a one year in Scott Harris episode. So that'll be early next week. I'm not really sure which one's going to be Monday yet. I got to figure out what uh, what I end up prepping for over the weekend and, and if any news comes out, etc. But um, that'll be one of those will happen relatively soon next week. So you can plan accordingly. Um, so let's get into some some names and positional groups and and uh, whatever. What's the word I'm thinking of? Positional groups, whatever concepts, maybe. Sure, why not? Uh, that went right for the Tigers this year. I think two big ones are Andy Abanez and Tyler Holton. And I guess that you could kind of just lump this into hitting on waiver claims in general. Uh, Tyler Holton, obviously, notab- very notably, like the the biggest, you know, most successful waiver claim on the team and one of the most successful waiver claims in baseball in recent memory. Uh, he had one of the highest war totals in the entire team. He pitched over 80 innings out of the bullpen. I think he eclipsed three war. I, I mean, like he was absolutely remarkable this season. And Andy Abanez, you know, I... I I think that Andy Abanez might be on this team next year as a utility infielder, and I wouldn't be mad about it if that was true. Now, they're not going to be able to have a roster with Nevin and Short and McKinstry and Abanez all on it. Like Two, if not three of those guys are all going to have to get removed, but I, I think that Abanez certainly made a case. He ended with an over 100 OPS plus. He ended the season with an OPS that was over league average, uh, and, I, and I think that that's very impressive. Now, he, he comes with his faults. He swings at literally everything, so he's not going to draw a ton of walks, and he's in his 30s now if you're thinking about like long-term pieces, I guess, but uh, so, and, and those players that are free swingers like that and, and do just like kind of like I'm going to go up there with the intent to put the bat on the baseball, right? They tend to be streaky, and Andy Abanez certainly was. Uh, when he first got called up, he was on fire. He had an OPS over a thousand, and you know his first little bit there. Then he went like one for forty or whatever it was, like some ridiculous cold streak. Uh, and then he got hot again, and then he got really cold again, and then he ended the season on like a month long heater in September. So uh, that that's just going to be the way, like the style that he plays. That's just what happens when you have a free swinger, kind of like bat to ball contact style of hitter, um, because you can't always control like where the ball go, goes, right? Hitting them where they ain't, isn't that easy? Uh, so he, he's, he's certainly has his faults and, and has his limitations on his ceiling. But as far as just like the waiver claim in a vacuum, objectively a massive success and, and was uh, one of your better hitters <laughs> on the team over the course of the full season. And uh, especially in the last like month, month and a half uh, was, was I- I- incredibly valuable. So was solid defensively too at second base. Uh, I, I would be okay if I didn't see Andy Abanez play third base really ever again, but he was really solid at second, specifically going to his left. Uh, and there's some metrics to back that up, but I test as well, man. Like if, if you just look at like, if he was starting towards second base and a ball was hit into the gap between first and second and he had to move towards first to his left and go make a play, he almost made every single one of those over the course of the season. And if you would have told me even two months ago, nonetheless, when they made the waiver claim, but if you even would have told me at the end of July, early August, that like I would be having a conversation surrounding like, oh, Andy Abanez might be back next year and I wouldn't hate it. I probably would have called you you wild and, and dumb. So very, uh, very impressive year for him. Obviously, Tyler Holton, there's not too much else that needs to be said. I don't expect Tyler Holton to have like a sub two ERA. Uh, he doesn't have like the peripherals or the strikeout numbers to like have like a one nine ERA or anything like that. So I expected to go up a little bit. But if this dude even is a lefty that puts up a three ERA for the next couple of years, even a lefty that puts up a three two ERA, a three three ERA, that's like unbelievably value and still a massive success story of a waiver claim. So um, definitely two thumbs up on those, those guys. Now, not every single waiver claim worked out, but that's how waiver claims work. They're, they're not all going to work out. Like the, most of them don't. Majority, vast majority don't. So the fact that we had a couple in one season that uh, that we're, we're pretty proud of, I think, is a, is a good sign and a good, successful, good job. 
Um, now we'll talk like your whole team can't be waiver claims. We, we don't want to get into like conceptually the concept of like what percentage, of, you know what I mean? I, I don't want this whole off season to just be 50 waiver claims. I'd like to actually go spend some money and sign some free agents, but identifying talent is, is a skill. And I'm glad that this front office so far has uh, found the ability to, to find production kind of between the cracks there. So uh, also a core developing is a big success. Uh, and, and within that, I really mean that the offensive core of Green, Torkelson, and Carpenter. And Riley Green has his injury problems, and Spencer Torkelson still has some things that he needs to work on to take a step, right? Like he had over 30 homers, but a like comfortably a sub 800 OPS, like wasn't even really close to an 800 OPS despite having over, over 30 homers on the season. And Carpenter didn't hit a home run the last like six weeks of the season. So like it, it, these guys aren't perfect players yet. But if you expected them to reach their ceiling in 2023, that's your own fault. And that's a preposterous thing to ask. Uh, this is a, this is a, a, a development path that is a, an, an increase year by year. And I think all three of these guys objectively took strides in the right direction. Torkelson, we already talked about 30 home runs, over 90 RBIs. Um, again, still has his faults, still has his stuff he needs to work on, but a massive step in the right direction from last season. Changed his mechanics this year uh, slightly. There's a couple of different, like, just weight shifting and hand placement and, you know, the, the bat he used. Like, there's there's so much within that, uh, that that he was adjusting, and, and it worked out well for him this year. Riley Green was fantastic fantastic before he got injured the first time uh, and then was kind of slowed down a little bit in between first injury and second injury and then second injury obviously sidelined him for the rest of the year. So staying healthy is a big thing for him, but we saw how good he can be when he's at full health and on the field. And then Kerry Carpenter, uh, I know that he he struggled a little bit in the last, you know, again, like six weeks, last month of the season, like the power numbers really fell off. But the bat to ball skills are still there. The peripherals are still there. I still think that he he's going to make adjustments this winter and come back next season. And he he's like one of the biggest, you know, if we're talking about success stories and like pros and cons, there's an argument that Kerry Carpenter is the biggest pro in this, in the biggest success story in this entire organization. This is a guy that like not everybody was on board for myself included. You can go back and look at the tape. All So all my takes stay online permanently, baby. Um, but like, if you even go back to like spring, people are like, yeah, like, I'm not sure he's going to make the team out of camp. Do we even want him on the opening day roster, et cetera, et cetera. And, and he finished the season with an OPS over 800 and was the middle of the lineup bat for this team and at over 20 homers, massive success story, not a top prospect, just all development, uh, in, in his own regard to, you know, has his own personal hitting coach and whatnot, but very impressive. Very, very impressive. So that core kind of like solidifying themselves as the core going forward. And on the pitching side of things, you can throw Scooble into there. Like you have a legitimate four or five guys that you're like, yeah, this is these guys are going to be on this team for a long time. And that's exciting. Um, the minor league system, I, I think, is a success story this year. And, and I, I want to break it down into four categories. This is I, I was a guest on the Tigers minor league report with uh, Rahelio. Uh, probably like a month ago now. This is probably a while ago, a few weeks for sure. And I, I the way I explained it there is, is how I'm going to reiterate it. Like there are, for me, you can break it down into four categories. Okay. You can break down development into four categories. You have minor league hitting development, minor league pitching development, and then major league hitting development and major league pitching development. I am now pretty confident in the minor league pitching and the major league pitching development for the Detroit Tigers. We've seen it time and time again. We'll talk about Olsen and Sawyer Gibson long later on in the show. There's a lot of success stories you can point to, to the pitching development at the major league level and minor league level of this organization in the last two years. The hitting development, I think, took a big step in the right direction in the minor league hitting development this year. I think that we saw, and you know, like Carpenter's Ascension kind of started last year. Um, but you know, like guys like big B Jace young had an incredible year, like you, you, Colt Keith, obviously like the emergence of him the last two seasons, there's a lot of it. Parker Meadows. What I mean, people forget Parker Meadows had like a six fifteen OPS and high single a at one point. And, and now, you know, we're talking about him as potentially the center fielder of the future. Like there's a lot of minor league success stories 
in the development department. The only kind of like domino I still want to see fall in that I'm not fully convinced is like as good as the other three is the major league hitting development. When that handoff is made and that baton is passed from a player working their way through the minors, then get promoting to the big leagues. We, I need to see more of like a, a player continuing to improve, continuing to make adjustments and like Torkelson. And, and we talked about Carpenter. Like, it's not like it hasn't happened, but that's like the last domino of like, I'm going to be fully confident in this developed system when that changes. And when I'm confident in that specific area. So I hope that I articulated it that well, but I mean, this is an organization that three or four years ago, I wasn't confident in any of those four phases that I just laid out. And now I'm, I'm fairly confident at, at worst in three of the four. And again, like varying, you know, the pitching, I'm probably a little more confident just in general than the hitting. But um, I, I've really, really enjoyed this. To, if we're just looking at 2023, I really found myself optimistic and very, very pleased with how uh, the development side of this organization worked this season. We're not the deepest organization, not the deepest farm system in baseball. We don't have a ton of like top prospects, et cetera. But like, if you just look back even a year ago, even two years ago, and look at the the changes in trajectory for a lot of these guys, I think most of it's positive. Not all, but no organization has a 100% hit rate with development. Baseball is too hard of a sport. It's impossible. And I think the good outweighs the bad for the most part. Okay, so that's another good one. Uh, let's keep the ball rolling. Got a few more things to talk about here. We'll do that right after I tell you all about our friends over at DoorDash. If you need fresh groceries this week but don't have time to go to the store, you should try grocery delivery from DoorDash. You'll get everything you want delivered when you need it right to your door. You and I, everybody really, has trusted DoorDash to deliver your restaurant favorites. And now you can get grocery delivery that actually delivers too. With thousands of grocery stores to choose from, you'll find the best in your neighborhood and boost your local economy with every order. You'll get exactly what you need and exactly what you ordered. Or DoorDash will make it right. So sit back and enjoy quality groceries just like you picked them yourself. Uh, if you want even more value, you can go to uh, you can go and get a DoorDash membership pass. And for a lot of grocery stores, have a zero dollar delivery fee which is awesome. So uh, also, 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 if you go right now, you can get 50% off of your first DoorDash order up to a $20 value when you use code LOCKDOWN at checkout. Limited time offer, terms apply. Don't forget that's code LOCKDOWN MLB for 50% off of your first order with DoorDash. What is up, everybody? Welcome back here. Third and final segment of Locked On Tigers. Appreciate y'all for tuning in as always. So I'm uh, going to finish up here. We got a few more things that I think went really well this season that we got to talk about. And, you know, I, I think it's pretty much impossible to bring up pros from the 2023 season without bringing up Tarek Skubal. Uh, I, I mean, just absolutely passed with flying colors. And I've said this like 15 times, and I'm going to say it again. I, I would have considered putting him on this list or just straight up put him on this list if he even came back and his ERA wasn't great, but like the stuff was still good. But he legitimately came back from injury, didn't give up a run for like his first like 12 innings or, or maybe it was like closer to like eight or, or 10 innings once he came back from injury, right? Found himself, got a, you know, gave up a little bit more hard contact there at one point when he was like five or six starts in. And then the entire month of December was uh, December. September was legitimately the best pitcher in the American League and might have been the best starting pitcher in the game of baseball. He is absolutely phenomenal. His stuff is disgusting. It plays against anyone. He has confidence in all of his pitches. So uh, he can kind of bounce around from opponent to opponent based on the scouting report and based on what they don't do well. Uh, and when when you hit that point where you have so many plus pitches and so much confidence in so many different pitches that you can start game planning against your opponent and not go like, oh, well, like this is what works best for me. And like if it works, you know, if they hit if how can I word this? If you're going in there and you're like, oh, I throw 70 percent fastballs and that's my best pitch. So that's what I throw the most. And you go up against a really good fastball hitting team and you're like, well, this is my game plan no matter what because it's my best pitch. Hopefully it works. 
there's a big difference between that and, oh, well, this team doesn't hit fastballs well. And even though I can throw 100, I still have a plus-plus slider and changeup as well. And they don't hit well against that. So I'm just going to only throw that today. Being able to game plan against your opponent is such a luxury um, that only really the best of, you know, everybody has their own game plan. I'm not trying to say that just like, you know, <laughs> 80% of pitchers just don't game plan. 100% of pitchers have a game plan going into their opponent and do their scouting reports and do their homework and whatnot. But being able to completely change your repertoire on a start to start basis, because it doesn't matter what you throw, that's going to be your best pitch that day is such a luxury. And that's what I think Tarek Skubal's ceiling truly is. So seeing him go out there healthy is a massive plus. Um, rookie optimism is a big one uh, for this season. We saw Reese Olsen. I, you know, I, Kerry Carpenter is going to get a lot of the publicity for this year for like, you know, biggest, one of the biggest success stories. I genuinely think Reese Olsen is like neck and neck with him. This is a guy that had an ERA of like nine when he got called up. And I think a lot of people had soured on him this year, at the start of this season from like last year. And a lot of that had to do with just like poor fastball production. His fastball wasn't really doing too much at the minor league level. And he got called up to the majors. And again, this is my point, like major league pitching development. We might just be elite. This organization might just be absolutely elite at developing young talent at the major league level on the pitching side of the ball. And I don't know how we lucked into that. I don't know how we tripped and fell into that. Uh, I remember the days, I, I don't, I'm not trying to call anybody out by name and be like disrespectful, but I remember the days just about four years ago when most people had us as one of like the worst coaching staffs in the league and our pitching coaching staff specifically was just ancient in terms of like with the times and modern analytics and stuff. And now we, we might have just one of the best in baseball and Fetter, Lund, and Nieves, and, and that's awesome. And I think Reese Olsen's a prime example of that. They utilized all of his pitches so well. They they taught him how to attack hitters given what his, his strengths and weaknesses are so well. And we saw improvement with his fastball as his major league season went on. And uh, for a guy who had like a five and a half ERA and people were like, oh, this dude's going to end up you know, in a bullpen somewhere, like he's not a starter or whatnot. In like early August, he ended the season with a sub four ERA. And I think a lot of people are are hopeful that he can be a starting pitcher as soon as next season. So he's a big plus. Sawyer Gibson long in that category as well, obviously uh, shown, I mean, a lot flashes of, of a really, really plus changeup. That changeup is unbelievable. I cannot Speak highly enough about the Sawyer Gibson long changeup, but he's got a mid nineties fastball as well. Like the stuff will play. So he's another one. Parker Meadows, obviously uh, getting, getting a look at the major league level at the end of the season. Uh, even if he doesn't hit for a lick, he's going to give you plus plus defense in a big center field and elite base running. And, uh, it, but he has some power as well. Like he was, a, he was hitting homers in the minor leagues, right? Like I, I think he could legitimately have the potential to be a 2020 guy with elite defense. And that's unbelievably exciting. So uh, he, I mean, he's another one, like it, it just, there wasn't too many, there's not a super long list. If there's a list at all, I'm trying to think off the top of my head of like rookies that came up and were just kept, like awful. And then we were like, Oh my goodness, we were going to have to send that them back down. Right. Like Torkelson last year got, got, sent back down to Toledo in the middle of the year because he was struggling so much. Like uh, we didn't have anything like that this year. And there's some people that are like, well, that's, you know, Scott, you impatient loser. Like that's why, you know, Keith and Malloy aren't up. And, you know, I, I don't have a rebuttal for that. Like fair enough. I, I still disagree. I, I still think that, um, that uh, my, 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 that doesn't change my mind on it. Uh, but I, I mean, the, the kids that came up and played this year showed flashes and uh, I, and like Parker Meadows took his lumps and he went through his O for 20 stretch or whatever. Uh, but I think he still showed a, a, a lot of flashes and uh, showed and again, like injected optimism in the fan base that he could be somebody that is going to be the starting center fielder for this baseball team going forward. And that's super awesome. So uh, I think some, some rookie optimism is definitely a big plus to this season. The last three names we're going to talk about, uh, Jake Rogers, I think is, is, uh, you know, 
recency bias is a thing. And, and like a lot of people, myself included, I, I say a lot of people and include myself in that have short term memory when it comes to some of this stuff. It wasn't like this March, this March, like like four months ago, whatever math, four or five months ago, like 2023 March. I, I mean, I, I was fighting off people that were like, this guy sucks. He's not going to be a major leaguer. Like he he hasn't shown the ability to hit. We shouldn't even give him an opportunity. He should start off in Toledo, et cetera. And like now he's like pretty objectively the starting catcher in 2024. And I think there's some optimism that he's going to be the starting catcher on this team for the next several seasons. Um, so that's a massive success. And it's not just because like, I mean, he, he didn't set the world on fire at the plate, but he, he's going to run into some homers. And the only thing I like, I don't care if he has a low batting average and his batting average, like isn't that great. Like this is a catcher, like catchers in general, you want a guy like AJ Hinge said at the end of the season, there's a game that uh, I think it was the game Carson Kelly homered and Kelly asked Hinch as a joke before the game. Do you want me to call a good game or hit a homer today? And AJ said, if I'm choosing between those two, call a good game. Like most teams will take poor offensive production from the catcher position. Uh, if it means that they're good game callers, handle the staff well and play good defensively. Rogers has 20 home run power and is good defensively and, and calls a pretty solid game. And so having that to our disposal is is great, and I I'm I'm pleased with uh, with the 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 concept in the idea of Jake Rogers being this team's starting catcher for the foreseeable future, and he proved that this season. Uh, Jason Foley, another one. You know, we we talked about Tyler Holton earlier. Uh, Jason Foley, I, I I think is one of the biggest success stories in the entire organization this year. Last year he was good. Uh, but his role completely changed. Last year, he was the fifth best reliever on the team last year. And this year, he, he was either the first or second best. So he went from being the guy that came, like last year, he was the first out of the pen guy. He was the fifth or sixth inning guy. And then he would be the bridge pitcher to hand the ball over to Jimenez, Fulmer, Soto, and who am I forgetting? Jimenez, Soto, Fulmer, Chafin, right? I always forget one. So going from that to then this year being the eighth inning guy and being the second high leverage reliever and like you're going to go in with runner, like inherited runners. You're not going to go in always with a clean inning. We might need more than an inning from you. Anytime there's a runner on first base, you're going in because you're the best chance of getting at us a double play. Like there's the, his role like tripled and he took it in stride and was better. Uh, he, he was absolutely phenomenal this year, let up a little bit at the end. I think part of that's just pitcher fatigue, but, uh, I also think that it's a sustainable brand of baseball. Some people worry about the per peripherals and worry about the fact that he doesn't get strikeouts and swings and misses. I understand that. And it definitely puts a ceiling on the heights that he can reach. I don't think Jason Foley's ever your closer. Um, if you're like a competitive, really good team, but I'll be darned. Like if I, I've, I've said it so often this season, I'll say it again. 29 other teams would do unthinkable things to have Jason Foley in their bullpen. 29 other teams envy the Tigers for having an automatic ground ball in their bullpen. That's such a luxury and that's such a unique skill to have, uh, especially in 2023. So I love Jason Foley. I hope he's here for the foreseeable future. And then we'll end on Michael Lorenzen. Michael Lorenzen is a big time success story for this team. Uh, it was, was that Scott Harris's first signing? His first signing might've been Matthew Boyd. I can't remember which one came first, but, um, one of his first moves last off season was signing Michael Lorenzen. And some people were like, eh, like, I don't know about that. You know, like this guy's been a reliever for a majority of his career. He finally started in LA last year. His numbers weren't great, but we talked about it on this show, right? You, you know, when, if you were a listener last winter, we talked about like Lorenzen in, the second half post injury of 2022 was phenomenal. Had like a two or even a sub two ERA at times uh, in the last like six weeks after uh, he came back from injury for the Angels as a starter in 2022. And uh, he had completely changed his his pitch strategy. He became uh, he had three pitches, but he was a two pitch pitcher based on what handness you were. And um, and the Tigers were willing to to pair him with Fetter, London, and Nieves. And 
uh, it worked out greatly. And he was an all-star. And I know that people giggled when he got the nod, but then he didn't give up a run for 20 innings. And he actually like kind of looked like he deserved to be an all-star. And then you have the trade deadline in which the Tigers get something for a one-year contract of Michael Lorenzen and how you Lee, right? Who is a prospect that he's not a blue chip or anything, but there's some optimism around how you Lee. And then there's some, some, uh, some, some excitement uh, around what he could be. He's a dominate the strike zone type of prospect. So yeah, like one year deal, he was a, your only all-star. He pitched really well when he was on your team, you realized you weren't going to make a run. You weren't going to like win the division or anything. So you traded him for a guy who's now instantly in your top, like 10 or 12 prospects in your organization. That is a massive win. So Michael Lorenzen certainly deserves to be on this list as well. All right. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We'll be back on Monday. Like I said, not 100% sure what yet, but I, I kind of gave you the rundown earlier of a few different things to expect in the next few episodes. So one of those will likely be Monday's regard, uh, unless, you know, there's some big news that were to happen over the weekend. Uh, enjoy playoff baseball. I, oh, nothing better than October baseball, baby. I miss the Tigers in it, but... It, I, I haven't missed a single second yet, and I don't plan on it. Uh, just absolutely electric. So enjoy that. And yeah, a lot more went right too. So please, uh, if, if there's something that you feel like, like really passionate about, like this was comfortably the best part of this season uh, or, or something that you think I, I missed or that, that you really think kind of uh, is very important to get out there, please, you know, comments, tweets, whatever they're called now, uh, feel free. And a lot more went right as well. This is not like it. Same as yesterday's show. If I was doing truly every single thing that did better than I thought it was going to be, uh, that would be a four-hour long show, as would the the opposite side of the spectrum as well, the cons list too. So uh, peace and love. Going to therapy's dope. And I'll catch you on Monday, baby. Go Tigers.